Welcome back. This is part two of the Assessive Compulsive and Related Disorders lecture, and we're going to have a look at the neurobiology involved in obsessive compulsive and related disorders in this slide set. So we need to pay attention to the basal ganglia and understand how certain components of the brain are wired that we have a better understanding of in terms of the obsessive compulsive and related disorders component. So the basal ganglia may be the primary site of obsessive compulsive disorder based on more recent research. The basal ganglia facilitates some of the movements of the body and also suppresses others. The basal ganglia is also involved in cognitive aspects of motor control in planning and executive motor strategies. Basal ganglia are also involved in planning and executive motor strategies. So taking a look at this in a little bit more detail, you see a, a slice of the brain which demonstrates the basal ganglia and its relationship to the globus pallidus the thalamus, the substantia nigra, and the cerebellum. Now, the basal ganglia is thought to be the primary site of pathology in obsessive compulsive disorders. The symptoms of OCD are thought to be the result of disturbances of the basal ganglia's functioning in filtering and suppressing cortical input. The basal ganglia is comprised of five interconnected nuclei, the cauda nucleus, the putamen, the globus pallidus, the subthalamic nucleus, and the substantia nigra. The cauda nucleus and the putamen together are known as the striatum. So that's important to get your mind around in terms of the different ways in which this area of the brain is described. Now, abnormalities of the basal ganglia in terms of its ability to filter and suppress information going to the brain's cortex are believed to be a cause of obsessive compulsive disorder. With impaired functioning of the basal ganglia, the cortex may be flooded with unprocessed information. Support comes from the increased rates of OCD that have been found in patients with disorders involving the basal ganglia. This is where these ideas are coming forward. And some of these include Huntington's disease, Tourette's syndrome, pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infections, otherwise known as PANDAS, and post-encephalitis Parkinsonism. So having a look at the striatum then, we understand that the striatum receives input from pathways that send signals to the central nervous system. The striatum also receives input from the cerebral cortex. The striatum processes the information, filtering out extraneous input before the information is transmitted to the thalamus which is the relay center for all sensory pathways to the cerebral cortex. So you can see how this is an important function of the brain and the striatum, which seems to be altered in obsessive compulsive disorder. <clears throat> so by controlling the information that's going from the thalamus to the cortex, the striatum is supposed to regulate the content and quality of information processed in the cortex of the brain. Now, the striatum is involved in fixed action patterns or inherited motor sequences such as grooming and nest building. Recently, it has been found that the striatum is involved in motor and cognitive procedural functions as well. Because the striatum includes the nucleus accumbens, it is thought that the striatum is involved in reward responses as well. Studies have shown that the head of the caudate nucleus and the pathway that connects the caudate with areas of the prefrontal cortex 
and with the anterior cingulated cortex are hyperactive and obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So this begins to make sense in terms of how much information is flying through the system. This hyperactivity may result in an inadequate inhibition of the thalamus that leads to deficits in the gating of information going to the cerebral cortex. In other words, there's something wrong with the inhibition which is supposed to be in place to gate information so that only a certain amount is able to flow. Now, the neurotransmitters that are involved in obsessive compulsive and related disorders include serotonin, which we believe inhibits behaviors such as impulsivity, suicidality, aggression, and anxiety. Dysfunction of the serotonergic system may contribute to the symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder. So understand that it's not just the neurotransmitter itself, but it's the system that is involved in dysregulation or dysfunction. Dopamine is also implicated because we believe that overactivity may be associated with obsessions and compulsions. In human studies, abuse of stimulants such as amphetamines, which increase dopamine, causes repetitive behavior that are similar to those found in obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So dopamine overactivity and the system involved with that may be due to a deficit in the serotonergic system that normally inhibits dopamine. So to remind you, dopamine and serotonin tend to be on a seesaw, if you will, with dopamine on one end and serotonin on the other. So when serotonin is increased, dopamine typically goes down. And when dopamine is increased too much, then serotonin starts to dip down. So it seems that there is, a, uh, there is an interrelationship between serotonin and dopamine that, that shows up quite strikingly in OCD. Now, we also wanna note that glutamate and GABA are probably also involved with glutamate, glutamate playing a role in modulation of ventral prefrontal striatal thalamic circuitry. So obsessive compulsive disorder may be related to hyperglutaminergic conditions in the prefrontal cortex. You remember that glutamate is most often an, an excitatory neurotransmitter and it may be that there is too much in the prefrontal cortex in obsessive compulsive and related disorders. Hyperactivity in the components of the orbitofrontal cingulate cauda palatothalamic neural circuitry is present in patients with obsessive compulsive disorder as evidenced by certain research studies. So abnormalities of brain structures are also noted in people with obsessive compulsive disorder and studies of the brain and functioning in patients with OCD are not consistent so that, in other words, it's not always the case, but there do seem to be abnormalities of brain structures with resulting impairment in function. Remember, Dr. Carroll talks about function and, uh, excuse me, structure preceding function. So in this case, we believe that the impairment includes uh, the areas of the cortex, the cingulated and the amygdala and the thalamus which sometimes shows up as enlargement of the ventricles, reduction of white matter volume, which is the myelin, and uh, abnormalities of the corpus callosum. So having a look at this uh, diagram and uh, transverse, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, cross-sectional uh, imaging, it shows the orbital frontal cortex and noticing where something seems to be wrong, sending a signal of worry uh, signaled uh, to the thalamus. Then the caudate nucleus, which normally suppresses worry signals, 
is thought to be damaged in obsessive compulsive related disorder um, patients and you can see uh, where the thalamus is here so the uh, structure again and uh, it precedes the function so the abnormalities in functioning then as we understand it are the functional abnormalities including increased activity of the CSTC circuitry, which we discussed earlier, in response to obsessions, with different parts of the circuitry showing increased activity during different rituals that patients practice. Abnormalities of functions and functioning are evidenced as problems with nonverbal memory, the ability to use coping strategies, visuospatial skills, and executive functioning. In addition to the observation of impaired functioning, functional impairment can be elicited on neurological examination as well. Um, on neurological examination, some patients with OCD, in comparison to controls without any psychiatric illness, evidence more impairment of fine motor coordination and sensory and visuospatial functioning, as well as more involuntary movements. So that seems to underpin our understanding of the pathophysiology. Now, the clinical presentation in patients with OCD is, is having patterns of dysfunctional beliefs. Their sense of responsibility for things happening, overestimation of a threat, perfectionism, intolerance of uncertainty, and the importance of controlling their thoughts Seems to, be, uh, seems to be a predominant set of findings. The uh, patients remember negative things more so than positive things, and they have difficulty ignoring intrusive thoughts. They equate thoughts with actions, and they believe that negative thoughts and doubts are the same as the behavior, and that the thoughts make the event more likely to happen. So this is, in a sense, a cognitive distortion. They believe that certain thoughts may be harmful and they must stop them in order to prevent the harmful event from occurring. So safety-seeking behaviors are among these symptoms we see. So patients with OCD use safety-seeking behaviors, behavioral rituals, neutralizing acts, avoidance, and suppression of negative thoughts, or that's what they're trying to do. They reduce the patient's distress for a short time, but in the long run, these behaviors can maintain or strengthen the obsessions and the urge to perform a ritual or neutralizing behavior. Finally, patients often keep their distress a secret for fear that, that other people will think that they are quote unquote crazy. So additional safety-seeking behaviors include patients uh, being resistant to change because change, whether it's positive or negative, brings about stress. They need to be certain of things and their uncertainty is very difficult to tolerate and they need to be in control in order to cope with their environment to keep it safe. But again, this can be a cognitive distortion. They have a need for perfection because of their fears of the consequence of not achieving perfection. So this is the end of part two. Please come back to watch part three where we can further explore obsessive compulsive and related disorders now that you have an evolving understanding of the pathophysiology involved. Thank you for viewing. We'll see you again for part three.